The next item of business is consideration of business motion 8792 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on changes to this week's business. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. I moved. Thank you, Minister. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 8792 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. Before we move to the next item of business, I invite members to join me in welcoming to the gallery the Honourable Mark Shelton MP, Speaker of the House of Assembly, Parliament of Tasmania. <clears throat> the next item of business is topical questions, and at question number one, I call Liam MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking in light of the grounding of MV Pentalina and any impact on ferry services to and from Orkney. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And firstly, I'd like to express thanks to the RNLI, Emergency Services and the crew for their work uh, on Saturday evening. Uh, ministers were kept informed throughout and I met with Orkney Islands Council on Sunday to discuss further. Uh, Northlink proactively contacted hauliers at the time of the incident to ensure that essential goods could be delivered uh, to Orkney, and I thank them for their action. We await detail from Pentland Ferries on the length of any outage. Transport Scotland met with Northlink over the weekend to discuss what potential increases in capacity may be needed on services to Orkney. Uh, we do, of course, also await the outcome of any investigation and actions to prevent any reoccurrence, and we need these answers as soon as possible. Liam MacArthur. Thank you. And uh, can I echo the Minister in paying tribute to RNLI, the emergency services, the Pentalina captain and crew, uh, as well as the local community in St Margaret's Hope for the part they played in responding uh, to events on Saturday evening with calm professionalism and generosity. While it will take time for the full facts to emerge about what led the Pentaline to be grounded, it is obviously in the public interest for answers to be provided as quickly as possible. Meantime, as we enter the busiest time of the year, Orkney is set to be without ferry provision on a key route for both passengers and freight over the coming weeks. So will the Minister therefore agree to approve a temporary resumption of four return sailings on the Stromness to Scrabster route, as occurred when the MV Alfred was out of service last year? Minister. Um, thank you, President Officer, and I thank uh, Mr MacArthur for his question. Um, as I said in my original answer, answer, Northlink ferries have already been proactive in reaching out to hauliers uh, and are monitoring capacity available across uh, their routes. Um, as Mr. Mr MacArthur is well aware, uh, from Monday there are three uh, return trips from Scrabster to Stromness. Uh, and we will continue to engage with Northlink ferries on other options available uh, and also keep uh, in close contact uh, with Orkney Islands Council about these issues. Uh, Mr MacArthur rightly uh, pointed out that uh, during uh, a previous incident, uh, four return journeys were put in place between Scrabster and Stromness. We will continue to monitor all of this and, if necessary, uh, we will consider uh, moving uh, towards that fourth return service to ensure the Orkney Islanders are served well. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you. Of course, the MV Pentalina was brought back into service due to the Scottish Government's desperation to plug gaps on the West Coast by chartering MV Alfred. This provides yet another reminder of the lack of resilience within the overall ferry network across Scotland due to the government's lack of investment in new ferries over the past 15 years. So what specific action is the minister planning to take to ensure that islanders and island communities in Orkney and elsewhere in Scotland do not continue to pay the price for the government's calamitous mishandling of ferry provision in this country? Minister. Um, the government are investing heavily in ferry services uh, and uh, as members will be aware, um, we have in order six ferries uh, for the network, um, which is important um, as we move forward. I heard Mr MacArthur on the radio yesterday um, talking about uh, Pentalina being rushed back into service. 
um, and he suggested that there was pressure uh, put on the MCA to do so. Can I put on the record um, that we are not aware of any pressure being put on the MCA, certainly not by CalMAC or ministers who would not be directly involved in that engagement. Uh, and given their role in rightly strictly enforcing maritime safety, it's doubtful uh, that the MCA would succumb to any pressures. Um, what we need to do uh, is to wait and see uh, what the investigation by the Maritime Accident Investigation Branch comes up with. Uh, and as, as I said previously, um, we want to ensure um, that we get these answers as soon as possible. Uh, but as members are aware, um, the Maritime Accident Investigation Branch and the MCA um, are governed by the UK Government uh, in reserve powers and do not answer to Scottish Ministers. Jamie Halker Johnston. Thank you. Can the Minister be very clear? If the MV Alfred can't return, the Pentelina is delayed getting back into service, there isn't the option of a replacement vessel and capacity can't be increased adequately via Northlink. Where does that leave residents and businesses on Orkney as we enter the peak season? And how will the Scottish Government compensate our islands for the loss of this vital route and the passenger and freight capacity it carries? Minister. Um, it's too early to say. Um, whether there's an immediate uh, need to consider uh, bringing Alfred uh, back into the Orkney service. And as I said to um, the leader of Orkney Islands Council, uh, Councillor James Stockin, on Sunday, uh, we will monitor to see uh, what uh, is happening in terms of the three return services that are in place. And if there is a requirement, we will look to move to that fourth service uh, that was put in place uh, previously um, when there was a difficulty with MV Alfred, Alfred uh, uh, previously. Um, the terms and conditions of the charter of MV Alfred are a commercial matter between CalMAC and Pentland Ferries. Um, there is no recall clause within the terms of the contract, which was a commercial decision made by Pentland Ferries as part of its discussions with CalMAC. But as I've said previously, uh, President Officer, I will, uh, the Government will, continue to monitor all of this as we go forward to ensure that the Orkney Islands are well served. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Does the Minister regret describing the situation for islanders as not brilliant? Would it be no, more appropriate to say it was disastrous? Minister. Um, what I would say is uh, not brilliant. The antonym of brilliant is, is gloomy, and I recognise that for some the situation is gloomy. Um, so not brilliant, gloomy is exactly what it is for some folks. Um, I've spoken um, to, to folks in Orkney. I recognise the difficulties that there are here. That is why I spoke to uh, Orkney Islands Council at the earliest possible opportunity uh, to ensure that we get this right for islanders um, as we move forward. Uh, and I will continue that engagement uh, with uh, Orkney Islands Council uh, and others uh, to ensure that we get this right. And I once again pay tribute to Northlink um, for their efforts in contacting uh, hauliers uh, very, very quickly indeed uh, to make sure um, that capacity was in place. But we will monitor and we will act accordingly. Question number two, Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reported comments from the Scottish Solicitors Bar Association that its plans for juryless trials uh, would be an affront to justice and that any proposed pilot could result in boycott action. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Presiding Officer, I am, of course, disappointed that some criminal defence lawyers are not in agreement with some of the recommendations flowing from the review carried out by Lady Dorian, Scotland's second most senior judge. The European Court of Human Rights has explicitly ruled that a jury is not necessary to deliver a fair trial. Trials without juries are not undemocratic or inherently unfair. Over 80% of criminal trials in Scotland are conducted without a jury currently. There is, of course, overwhelming evidence that false beliefs and preconceptions influence jury decision-making in cases of rape and attempted rape, which, coupled with the significant and long-standing disparity on conviction rates in these cases, is a cause for concern. 
Therefore, a time-limited pilot of single-judge rape trials will enable us to gather objective evidence to inform the debate on this issue and is entirely compatible with an accused's right to a fair trial. And we have, of course, been working closely with stakeholders, including the legal sector, on proposals and will continue to do so. Jamie Green. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? It's, it is, of course, true to say that everyone wants to improve outcomes for victims of these horrific crimes, but the government's proposals for juryless trials has resulted in a significant backlash from the judiciary. Now, the Cabinet Secretary just mentioned the ECHR. She'll be aware of Lord Lewis's comments today, a retired senator of the College of Justice, who described the pilot and its ministerial review as, I quote, constitutionally repugnant, which constitutes a serious attack on the independence of the judiciary. He went on to say that a court with limited lifespan working under such constraints could not, in his view, be considered an independent tribunal within the meaning of Article 6 of the ECHR. The Faculty of Advocates it described the proposal as anti-democratic and the Bar Association themselves made the very stark claim that no other civilised country dispenses with juries in such cases. They will actually go as far as balloting their members to potentially boycott these trials, which makes a complete mockery of the pilot itself. So I suppose the fundamental question I have for the government is this. What makes them all so wrong on this matter and the government all so right? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, we are at the very start of a, a parliamentary process where the Victims' Witness and Justice Reform Bill will be debated in detail and, of course, scrutinised, I hope, to the very highest of standards. And for my part, I am absolutely determined to have the highest standard of debate on these matters and, indeed, scrutiny, where we are focused on the substance because we need the people of Scotland and, indeed, victims and complainers to be proud of the debate that we are about to embark upon. Now, of course, the recommendations in hand, uh, yes, are being put forward by the government, but they, of course, come from uh, significant deliberative uh, recommendations of a cross-sector review led by Lady Dorian, who said and recommended that we gather evidence to inform this debate so that we can move forward and we can establish whether in its treatment of rape and serious sexual offences do we have a justice system that is fair and balanced to all involved in that, bearing in mind the evidence that we do have around conviction rapes and the prevalence of precon preconceptions seems like a very uh, legitimate uh, inquiry to have. And it may also be of interest to the Chamber, presiding officer, that there is no single approach to the use of juries in criminal cases in other comparable uh, jurisdictions. Uh, New Zealand, for example, and indeed France, have moved away from jury trials for particular uh, sexual offences cases. So there is a wealth of evidence uh, out there that we need to debate, look at and inform our approach going forward to do our best by women when they are at their most vulnerable, but also to ensure the integrity of the system for everybody involved. Katie Green. Uh, look, I agree with much of what the Cabinet Secretary says. I keep an open mind on the outcomes of this legislation, but we cannot ignore what are very uh, serious, I think, and direct uh, uh, pieces of feedback from senior members of the judiciary. Um, the Cabinet Secretary wrote in the media over the weekend that the principal rationale, I think, for juryless trials was because, I quote, there is overwhelming evidence that jurors are subject to preconceptions about rape. So I guess my first question is, if that be true, then why would the answer to that simply be to remove juries altogether and not to educate or improve the jury process? Uh, the Scottish Government has done very limited research uh, into this issue, which has drawn much criticism, and it also fails to ignore other forms of research into this, including that by the University of London, which quizzed real jurors about the so-called myths and stereotypes around these crimes. So my question to the Cabinet Secretary is, if in advance of introducing legislation which removes the accused person's fundamental right to a jury trial, will the government commit to immediate and comprehensive research into jury attitudes here in Scotland? using the real-life testament of jurors who have tried people in rape cases, so that any policy change is driven by evidence and not just by assumptions. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, it's important that we recognise that the um, existing evidence and the existing views, whether that's of victims or indeed parts of the legal establishment, 
that that does not in any way negate the need for other research and measures. And of course, there was a number of recommendations uh, made by Lady Dorian that are already being taken forward uh, by the judiciary. But this debate we are having needs progress. Some of these issues are long-standing and we've been debating them uh, oh, for around 40 years. So we now need to make progress for all involved and in particular victims who I think we all agree in this chamber that we need to improve that end-to-end -end, uh, justice uh, journey. Now, in terms of the evidence, can I point uh, members to the policy memorandum that actually quotes and examines uh, a range of evidence? We will, of course, um, have further discussions and debates um, around that. But if I point to paragraph 544 in the policy memorandum um, that states, um, and this is based on research from 2023, that research examining the existence and influence of rape myths is now vast and empirical evidence is reliable enough to conclude that widespread endorsements of rape mythology spans varied societies, cultures and distinct social groups. And members are perhaps also aware of the work by Professor Fiona uh, Leverick, Professor of Criminal Law and Criminal Justice at the University of Glasgow, who states there is overwhelming evidence that jurors take into the deliberation room false and prejudicial beliefs about what rape looks like and what genuine rape victims would do, and that these beliefs affect attitudes and verdict choices in concrete cases. I will take um, some supplementaries. I will require more concise responses, Cabinet Secretary. I call Audrey Nicholl. The Lady Dorian Review acknowledged several benefits that could be achieved through single judge trials, including reducing the impact of rape myths. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with the Review that reducing the impact of rape myths is a very important factor in removing stigma and ensuring a fair trial for survivors? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, presiding officer, removing the impact of rape myths on jury decision making uh, is, in my view, absolutely vital to ensuring that we have a justice system uh, that is fair to both complainer and accused. Uh, the evidence shows clearly, as I've referred to earlier, that this balance is not being achieved at present uh, due to the impact uh, of cultural misconceptions or indeed the, the stigma that Ms Nicholl uh, refers to. Uh, therefore, conducting a, a time-limited pilot provides us all with an opportunity uh, to explore whether single judge trials can mitigate the impact uh, that currently exists on jury decision making in cases of rape and attempted rape. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Can I register my concern regarding uh, juryless trials, let alone a pilot in rape cases? For example, the right to appeal, let alone appeal itself, a judge-only conviction compared to that of a conviction by a jury to me raises serious issues of parity of right to justice. Cabinet Secretary. Sign off, sir. Perhaps I would be helpful to the member if I actually quote from uh, Lady Dorian's review again when she said that consideration should be given to develop a time-limited pilot of single-judge rape trials to ascertain their effectiveness on how they are perceived by complainers, accused and lawyers, and to enable the issues to be assessed in a practical way uh, rather than a, a theoretical way. And also to say uh, to Ms Graham that as we proceed um, with the, the, the detailed work that has already uh, commenced, uh, that there is already a number of recommendations made about case criteria criteria, objectives uh, and evaluation. Uh, but the recommendation was for us also to do further work um, in and around these matters because we need to ensure uh, the integrity of the, the, the system and to ensure that, that the matters of appeal um, and fairness, both to victim and accused, that we get the right um, balance between being bold, but we protect the integrity of our system at all times. That concludes topical questions.